科学与空中治理专题演讲。我们邀请 Professor Grant Altinger 主讲环境正义的资讯基础建设，并且由台大公共卫生学院詹长全副院长主持，并语谈。现在让我们将时间交给主持人詹副院长，谢谢。欢迎大家回来哈！早上已经讲了，说应该每个人为自己鼓掌了哈。这个这种长假还是愿意来谈这个，大家都一起来学习嘛。那今天下午我们有这个关欧林的教授呢，啊，来开始主讲。啊，他现在是这个美国 d r e s o 大学的这个啊政治系的教授。那他的背景很很奇特哈，大学部其实是学理工的。然后在研究所是在 U C Berkeley 这个啊跨了这个社会跟这个啊能源还有这个人类学等等的，有很多的跨领域的研究哦，这个是台湾现在正在推的，所有的学生都希望他这个呃、啊、跨领域的研究是是台湾最需要，那他。得到一个非常重要的奖，叫 Richard Parsons Prize 啊，就是在说他的这几年的研究里面，他在这方面的一个成果。那我们这一次这个呃邀请他来的是杜文平教授啊，在过去呃接近快两个礼拜里面，好多台湾他的粉丝都追着他的这个 Facebook 啊，这个呃 ，What when you left, you know, and、uh, Professor Du is in trouble. Everybody wants to meet him. You're crazy. I said this Du Professor has arranged it very well, so the Taiwan students are very jealous. So next time they will come to him. So this we will have in the evening. So everyone can have a warm welcome. One, two, three, four. Thank you. 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 1994, there was a big accident here. This refinery released a neurotoxin called catacarb for 16 days before the plant finally shut down. In the aftermath, activists advocated for a fence line monitoring system that would produce continuously and in real time information about what was in the air, what, what toxics were in the air that they were breathing. Their efforts catalyzed a movement to advocate for and do more air monitoring at oil refinery fence lines. And the system that they eventually won, installed in 1996, became a gold standard for other fence line communities who were, um, in those communities, using inexpensive air monitors called buckets um, to find out what was in the air. So we'll talk more about buckets in a minute. That was in 1994. 15 miles away, in Richmond, California in 2012, there was an explosion and fire, um, a, a very large one. You could see the plume all the way around the Bay Area. And regulators at the time responded by saying that they did not detect any chemicals from the release, which seemed implausible to everyone who was um, watching. Um, and the event plus the response by regu regulators brought 
immediate calls for better air monitoring at um, oil refinery fence lines. So by the following March, so this happened in August of 2012, by March of 2013, Chevron, the um, company who owns the oil refinery, had arranged for six monitoring sites to be installed around the facility and their data made available to the public on the website. That event also prompted regulatory attention more generally to the issue of fence line monitoring. In 2016, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, the regulatory agency with jurisdiction over the two refineries you've just seen, Phillips 66 and Chevron, and three others, including this one, Shell Refinery in Martinez, California, um, they adopted a rule that requires all of the refineries in the, um, in the jurisdiction of the Bay Area Air Quality Management District to do continuous, real-time fence line monitoring. Um, and that is about to happen. Refineries submitted their monitoring plans to the Air District just last month, and after a period of regulatory review and public comment, those monitors should come online sometime at the end of next year. Okay. So there's been a lot of attention to fence line air monitoring, getting more monitoring data. Um, it's not just at oil refineries. This is a um, picture from my home city of Philadelphia in, in Pennsylvania in the US. Um, it's the other side of the country. But it, there's a similar initiative in a way. Um, this is an example of the US EPA's Village Green project, uh, which consists of these park bait bench shaped air monitoring stations. So this is a this is actually an air monitoring station, and it measures levels of ozone and particulate matter, um, and it makes the information that's collected available to people by their smartphone. Okay, so we are at a moment where there is a lot of interest in increasing the amount of information that's available to communities and the public about environmental exposures. And I've seen, um, I've seen evidence of that here in Taiwan as well, with the, uh, with the last network, for example. Um, a lot of people paying attention to how do we get more information about what's in the air. And these are made possible, these efforts are made possible, it, it, we should point out, by developments both in sensor technology Right, so we can do more, we can, we can measure more using lower cost devices. And also information technology, which lets us handle large amounts of information and you know, get, them, get them where we want them. However, um, over 20 years of air monitoring, uh, fence line, continuous fence line air monitoring in the Bay Area shows that just having the information does not necessarily change things. So in um, Crockett and Rodeo, fence line data is little used by the public. It's hard to document concrete changes that it may have made in refinery performance or regulatory enforcement. I can only give you one example from over 20 years of monitoring. Um, so how can we think about these data as having the potential to contribute to environmental justice or community empowerment? How can we engineer systems that enable the data to be used strategically by people who are advocating for communities that are living with toxins? So for me, these questions are both theoretical and practical. Um, in this talk, I'm going to first give you the theoretical framework for how I think about answering this question. Um, and that is the, the brief version of that, just as an uh, introduction to what you'll hear, is that in order for data to actually further environmental justice, the data need to become part of information infrastructures that support community-based ways of making meaning of the data. Okay. And I will, I will tell you in detail what I, what I mean by that. Um, then I'll talk briefly about my experiment in putting this theory into practice, uh, which is a participatory design project with communities in the Bay Area uh, to create web-based resources for better understanding and mobilizing the fence line monitoring data that you've just heard me talk about. Okay, so 
Um, what we mean when we talk about environmental justice, that term um, often evokes the idea of a community that is um, right up against some hazardous facility and um, that they are suffering from the pollution uh, in a kind of pollution from some local source. Um, it's worth, I think, breaking down the components of that. What are people really asking for when they're asking for environmental justice? And one scholar has done a nice job of that in saying, okay, environmental justice isn't just about let's get the plant out of here. That's not really, that's not really what it means. But what environmental justice is, is people want fair distribution of hazards, okay, so not concentrated where the most marginalized people are. They want the right to have a say and to meaningfully influence um, the decisions that affect their lives. Um, they want recognition of their particular um, cultures and ways of um, interacting with the land, ways of thinking about the land and the air and the water. Um, and this, third, this last point, capabilities, is the idea that everybody deserves a right to have everything they need to lead a good life, to flourish, okay? So this is how um, David Schlossberg defines environmental justice. I think it's a very good framework, and it's based on you know, talking to people who are environmental justice activists. But what he doesn't do is study and talk to people who are really obsessed with doing air monitoring, that's what I do. And um, from talking to them, I say that he's missing one thing. What he's missing is the idea of epistemic justice. So let's talk about what that is. This idea of epistemic justice comes from the feminist philosopher Miranda Fricker. In her 2007 book, she defines an epistemic injustice as a wrong that's done to a person in her capacity as a knower because that person has an identity that is structurally marginalized, okay? The person is a woman, the person is um, a racial minority, the person is disabled, the person is an immigrant, that, that kind of um, marginalized identity. And for Fricker, when she talks about epistemic injustice, she means there are two possible kinds. The first one is a testimonial injustice. And that occurs when a person with a marginalized identity makes a claim to knowledge that is discounted on the basis of her identity. So let me give you an example from the early days of the environmental justice movement, the anti-toxics movement in the United States. Um, Lois Gibbs was a resident of Love Canal, and she has um, since gone on to found a very influential NGO <coughs> called the Center for Health, Environment, and Justice. But at the time, she was just a mother, and she believed that her son was ill because of exposure to toxic waste near his school. So she met with the school superintendent, trying to get her son moved to a different school. And as she tells the story, she slid two doctor's notes across the desk, saying her son's sickness could be tied to the dump. The superintendent of the school glanced at the notes and slid them right back to her. He said, we're not going to do that because of one hysterical housewife with a sick kid. Okay. So he rejects what Gibbs has to say, even though she comes with evidence from her doctor, right? Um, or multiple doctors. But uh, he rejects her not because of the quality of her evidence, but because she's a woman, because she's a housewife. Right? And, and branding her as hysterical is, is like a sure giveaway that this is a testimonial injustice. All right, so hermeneutic injustice is more complicated and it's what I'm going to spend most of my time on. And this is about people's access to concepts, frameworks, categories, and languages for making meaning and having it heard and understood in the public discourse. So, Fricker's contention is that people from non-dominant groups are stuck with a category set that comes from the experiences of dominant groups, which makes it harder for the non-dominant groups to articulate their own experience. Okay, so let me give you the example that she gives, which is that of um, the term sexual harassment. So in the 1960s, 
unwanted sexual advances in the workplace and coercion to get involved sexually with one's supervisors was part of women's experience. Um, but there was no way, there was no way to talk about it, there was no language for it. Only once that term was coined in 1975 did sexual harassment become a thing that could be talked about and made a target of policy. So in Fricker's terms, she would call this a, a hard-fought expansion of the hermeneutic resources available to women, of the concepts available for talking about their experience. Um, now, Fricker refers primarily to women and racial minorities when she talks about structurally marginalized groups. I would say that in the environmental context, um, people without technical training, so-called lay people, are, um, are also, you can think of them also as a kind of structurally marginalized category. And that's for two reasons. One, because experts are so dominant in environmental decision making. They really control how the conversation goes. And the second is that the identity of expert is not equally accessible to everyone, right? Men have more access to being considered an expert than women do, for example. Um, so um, I think we can think of that in environmental context as one of the intersectional categories that goes with um, structural marginalization. Okay, so that's epistemic injustice. I claim that air monitoring by communities on the front lines of petrochemical industry, the ones right next to oil refineries and other um, hazardous facilities, um, that air monitoring is a response to epistemic injustices against lay people, who are often women, often people belonging to racial minorities, often elderly people. Um, and they, so not all of them are using the fence line air monitors that I talked about to begin with, the continuous real-time air monitors. More of them are using devices like this that just give you a snapshot of what's in the air. They, they take a sample of the air, the sample is then analyzed, and then you know what was in the air when that sample was taken. Um, so what happens with these samples is that they give lay people quantitative data to make it more difficult for experts, for regulators, for um, refinery managers to dismiss their testimony because they're not scientists. Um, so a community member who is told, no, no, we didn't have a release that day, can go there with their, um, with their results from the, the bucket sample analysis and say, oh yes you did, I can tell. <laughs> not just because I smelled something, which I did smell something, and not just because I couldn't catch my breath, <coughs> which I couldn't, but also because this sample shows what a high level of toxic chemicals were in the air that day. Okay. So that's, it's a response to testimonial injustices. There are also, I think, a response to hermeneutic injustices. And that hermeneutic injustices, injustice comes in in the way that experts think about air quality in fence line communities. So for example, they use risk assessment frameworks, which have been widely criticized for not matching communities' experiences or goals. Um, and in the air quality case, risk assessment frameworks usually divide exposure to toxins into acute, um, which would be very high levels of exposure over short periods of time that are tend to be regarded as anomalous, and chronic, which are very low levels of pollution over long periods of time. Now, the experience, and, that, and that's, that's fine as far as it goes, but the experience of living next to a refinery is that medium high or subacute levels occur with some regularity, and they tend to erode people's health. And as a result, um, they're a systemic, even actually a chronic problem that isn't represented in this framework used by experts in their risk assessments. Okay, so the way that um, people use buckets to address that um, failure of the dominant concepts to give meaning to their experience is that they take their snapshot of what's in the air, it's maybe five minutes, and they compare it to a standard 
for what is allowable in the air oh, as an average over of the whole year. Okay, so they say, yes, I know you meant this to be an average, but you know the fact that we saw it for five minutes is still consequential because this kind of five-minute exposure happens over and over and over again throughout our year. It's a systemic problem if we can compare it to the chronic standard, right? So that's an intervention. It's a way that they're trying to um, upset those concepts that they're stuck with from the dominant narrative. Okay, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. It'll all come together in a minute. This kind of risk assessment concepts and categories that I was talking to you about can be considered a kind of information infrastructure. And you, you probably are familiar with the idea of infrastructure as roads and bridges and things like that. Um, but the idea of infrastructure in uh, the sense of information or knowledge was developed by STS scholars, including Lee Starr, Jeff Bopper, and Paul Edwards, who were interested in how knowledge gets made by geographically dispersed, and in some cases, disciplinarily heterogeneous groups of scientists. So information infrastructures can include databases, um, data entry <coughs> forms, websites, that kind of thing. All the apparatus that goes into collecting and making sense of data. And they play a hermeneutic role. These, these infrastructures play a hermeneutic role in that they, um, the way that they're structured gives meaning to the data. Okay? Um, so scholarship in this area also shows that um, systems of categories, classifications, are built right into the infrastructure. So every infrastructure encodes certain ways of thinking about the world, and as a result makes some things visible and knowable and meaningful and other things not. So back to that distinction between chronic and acute in the risk assessment case. That distinction lets scientists um, point to both um, health effects that occur immediately as a result of high levels of um, chemical exposure, but also lets them um, draw attention to health effects that develop over time as a result of long-term chemical exposure. Okay, so that actually it makes it enables them to include long-term exposure to carcinogens in their model of risks to communities. So it, it makes something important visible, but at the same time it leaves out recurring subacute exposures that fence like communities think are just as important. So it makes other things invisible. Okay. okay. So to the extent that infrastructures mediate the way that people encounter and make sense of information, we need to think of them as integral to the creation of hermeneutic injustices, okay? Because they've got some category systems, the dominant group's category systems, and not others. Or at least the, the, you know, the, the category systems of the people who are making the infrastructures, who are usually the, the dominant groups. Um, okay, so if information infrastructures are hermeneutic resources that can perpetuate epistemic injustices. They can also be a point of intervention for um, trying to get rid of the epistemic injustices, right? For trying to ameliorate the hermeneutic injustices that already exist in fence line communities, for fence line communities. Okay, so our goal um, should be to create, in my opinion, should be to create information infrastructures that can help community groups use data to more effectively communicate the way that they experience and understand pollution and its effects. And to let them articulate new insights that are based in the data but also consistent with local experience. Um, so from, so that's the, you know, the big goal. From existing research, we can point to a number of features that um, an information infrastructure that's consistent with environmental justice, with epistemic justice, would have to have. So first it would need to draw in local knowledge. It would need to enable people to reject or challenge or articulate alternatives to scientists taken for granted frameworks, like risk assessment. 
And finally, it would need to enable communities to use data in a way that showed the systemic nature of the exposures that they experience, even the ones that, um, yeah, even the ones that aren't the acute ones. Okay, so you, we have information infrastructures already for looking at monitoring data. And the next question is, well, how well do they do compared to these criteria? And you might not be surprised to learn that for the most part, they don't do a very great job. Okay, so let's start with the website that provides the information to the public from that first monitor, that first air monitor that I told you about in Crockett, California in 20, uh, that, that was established in 1994. Um, this is the page for that system, the, the website. Um, on the, I cut off some at the bottom right that has a, a wind direction arrow. Um, and what it does is it just displays what's in the air right now. And it'll update in five minutes, um, and that's all you get. With a more recent monitoring system of the Chevron refinery in Richmond, it looks similar. You have what's in the air right now, and it updates. You have a wind direction arrow. And you have, um, if you hover over one of the values, you can see what's been there for the last 24 hours. But that's all you get. Okay, so this site, it only displays quantitative information. It only looks at the immediate situation, what's right now. And in the process, it positions the users, the public, as consumers of data, but not potential providers of information, okay? So they are not knowers in this website. And it offers little opportunity for the exploration of data. You can't go back in time any further than 24 hours. You can't download the data. You can't print the data. Um, you can't pull it onto your smartphone where you can search it. So I would say, you know, drawing, going back to our idea of hermeneutic justice, it doesn't create any potential to tell new kinds of stories or develop new ways of making meaning. Right, so that's one kind of information infrastructure that's available to fence line communities. Here's a second that's the total other end of the spectrum. Um, and this is in, in communities that don't have fence line air monitoring, there has emerged another kind of platform that allows users to report incidents, smells, spills, that kind of thing from petrochemical plants. So they can report their observations and their experiences. So this one is the Eyewitness Pollution Map, which was developed by the Louisiana Bucket Brigade in Louisiana. But there are a handful of others, some of them developed in California. Um, they're developed and maintained by environmental justice um, activist groups, NGOs often in collaboration with local government agencies. This, this one does not involve the government. And on these sites, you can report uh, an incident or an observation. You can report it online. You can send, um, leave a voicemail. You can send a text. And the user can include photos. They can include freeform descriptions. They can include all kinds of qualitative information in addition to choosing a category for the report you see on the right there, the categories um, that you can choose when you report. You can look at other people's reports, both individually and in the aggregate, and you can see how many reports were submitted over a given period of time. So the, the graph at the bottom is the number of reports um, submitted for a you know, given month. So many websites like this are part of a larger infrastructure that also includes a committee that will look at these reports and follow up with responsible authorities as necessary. So the features of platforms like this are much more conducive to advancing hermeneutic justice, as I described it earlier. Right? They enable people to contribute their information. They, they start out as knowers. Um, they have the potential to demonstrate long-term impacts by accumulating reports over time. But as hermeneutic resources, they're also quite limited. They don't engage at all with quantitative data. Um, they don't even create many pathways for understanding the quality of reports as a set. 
right? They're kind of one at a time or an aggregate, like a pile of them, but not um, what there are individually. Or, or, I mean, what they, there's not room to synthesize. Now this limitation is somewhat mitigated um, where people are getting together to assess the reports. And in, in those sites we can see that maybe they are inventing new ways of thinking about them. Um, but it's hard to say, because I haven't studied them, whether those groups give communities space to make sense of, make sense of data in new ways or just reinforce experts' ways of looking at the data. Okay, so that's the theory. It's an application of what's already out there in the world, real world. Here's my experiment. Um, I have, uh, over the past year, almost two, um, been doing something I call the Meaning from Monitoring Project, which is a participatory design project with residents of those Bay Area refinery communities that either have air monitoring already, real-time air monitoring already, or are about to get it. Um, and we have a goal. Our goal is to make fence line monitoring data more useful for community members through the development of an accessible, interactive website. Okay, so this is the goal. Um, that's the goal that I tell to community members, with the pragmatic one. The second goal here is also the goal, but stated in the terms that I just gave you from the theory, um, which is to expand the hermeneutic resources that are available for making sense of real-time monitoring data by creating an alternative information infrastructure. Okay, Same goal, different language to talk about. So in our project, um, our ideal website design would do these things. Um, and these are informed by a combination of prior research on citizen science and environmental justice communities and by our ongoing deliberations as in the design process. Um, they would, the ideal design would integrate quantitative and qualitative data. They would let residents contribute um, experiences and other qualitative data. It would support the circulation of new representations of environmental problems, would let people um, make meaning and then pass around. It would enable people to explore all different kinds of data in a way that didn't, um, that kept the data together, right? That the different kinds of data would, would be linked somehow. And that would include processes, which may or may not be electronic. Um, they may be purely social and political for collectively interpreting the data and acting on it. Okay, so I think this is what's necessary to support community groups, not only in understanding their data as experts understand it, but also in using it to support their understandings, the way they understand the effects of pollution and the need for systemic change. Um, I think it's probably also generalizable to any information infrastructure that seeks to support environmental justice, especially the epistemic aspects of that. Okay. So we're still, the Meaning for Monetary Project is still in the development process, but let me um, give you just a brief um, take a tour through what we've done so far. We have our own website that's an alternative defenseline.org. Um, you can see in the um, tabs across the top, it incorporates data from three different places. Um, all of the, the two places that are part of fenceline.org plus one more. Um, if you click on one of those places, this is Richmond, um, you get the data. Um, this is about a month's worth of data. You can zoom in and out. You can see the wind direction, that's what this arrow is here, um, where the red line is. You can jump to a different day entirely. Um, so there's the ability to explore. The site also, okay, so this is still quite complicated. There's a lot of information here, so it doesn't break it down very much. So we have also created a daily summary that people can sign up for. Um, and uh, the animations on these slides aren't working. I apologize for that. Um, I would 
meant, this slide meant to give you a picture of the whole daily summary and then zoom in on one part of it. All we've got is the zoom. Um, but this is, so this is um, a summary of benzene for a particular day in August in Rodeo. Um, and we had to make a number of choices about what was important, potentially, about the data. Um, one of them was that we chose to send a summary every time there was a detection, which detections are fairly unusual in this system, rather than waiting until the detections cleared some health threshold, because those health limits are so uncertain. Um, we decided to use a maximum one hour average to characterize how bad a given day was. Um, one hour because it seemed too, it seemed sort of long enough but not too long, um, short enough but not too short uh, to catch variation. And that hour doesn't, it doesn't have to start at two o'clock and go to three o'clock. It can start at 2.16 and go to 3.15, right? Um, so it's a rolling hour. And we report the total time that we have chemicals detected, which also seemed key to me, right? Was this an afternoon's worth or was this all day? And those are the kinds of things that go into an average. It tells you something about the average, but it doesn't tell you the average. So it doesn't yet add up to a story about exposures or impacts that's more systemic. Um, but it does start to move us beyond a focus on immediate individual exposures in the way that fenceline.org emphasizes. And the last feature is that we have a mobile app that allows users to report smells and other observations. And the, the, you get the time and location from the smartphone itself, and then um, people can people give a, new, oops, a numerical report, right? And then have the possibility of some quality of information. And once they do that, the reports that people give appear on the, on the website as well. So in this column of smell reports that can then go, you know, you can see what the, what the air quality measurements were at the same time. Again, it's not all the way to the kind of synthesis you might hope you know, that, I, that I outlined when I said what should be an ideal system. But I think it's a step in the right direction. So here again, um, we are, this is, this is what we're measuring ourselves against. Um, we do integrate different kinds of data. We hope next to make the integration more streamlined and include more kinds of information, including time-lapse images of the refinery stacks. Um, the smell reports are one way of allowing new representations to circulate, and we created those in PDF format so people could print them out and hand them out. That was something that residents felt very strongly about, that they wanted to be able to take them to their community meeting. Um, we, the website enables exploration of the data, but we haven't yet built any processes for collective interpretation of the data. So that's one of our next steps, and we hope to work with the Bay Area Air Quality Management District to see whether it's possible to build collaborations that will get everyone looking at data together. Okay, so um, that's, what I have to say about my project, I want to thank some people, um, including the Amy Gonsagan, who is the wonderful student programmer who made the website and the app um, actually real. Um, and of course, the, the National Science Foundation for funding the project. And if you would like to learn more about my work, um, this is my research group's website, fairtechcollective.org. Um, I am looking forward to our discussion.